Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis. This week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at Blue Bank Resort on Real Foot Lake. If you're looking for the best place on the lake for fishing, eagle watching, or enjoying some of the best catfish in the region, you'll find it at Real Foot Lake. Visit bluebankresort.com and reserve your cabin today. Welcome to Real Foot Forward from Discovery Park of America, located up here in the corner of beautiful West Tennessee. Every day at our museum and heritage park, we inspire children and adults to see beyond. And each week, we do the same thing here on our podcast. In today's episode, Scott sits down with Lindsay Parham, who is the supervisor of career technical education for the Weekly County School District. They talk about why students wear blue corduroy jackets in the middle of a heat wave and what she sees for the future in the world of agriculture. And later, join us as we discover something new here at Discovery Park of America. Hello, hello. I am Scott Williams. Welcome to Real Foot Forward where every single week we explore the culture, the spirit, the accomplishments, and the heritage of West Tennessee, just like we do every single beautiful day here at our Museum and Heritage Park in sunny Union City, Tennessee. My guest today is the incredibly smart and talented Lindsay Parham, Supervisor of Career Technical Education for the Weekly County School District. Welcome, Lindsay. Thank you. So so your title now is, and make sure I get it right, Supervisor of Career Techno- Technical Education. What does a person who has that title do? Um, in Weekly County, we have 18 different teachers that are in career and technical education. Um, we have got agriculture. We have family consumer sciences. We have health sciences, um, manufacturing, um, computer applications and business management, Um, The center of all of that is career and technical student organizations. Um, Agriculture has kind of been the brainchild of it, and I may brag about it more because that's what I've been teaching for 13 years. But you've got the classroom aspect of it. Then you also have what we call a supervised agricultural experience program, which in a rural area like we're in, you've got kids who work on farms, but it goes much beyond that. It could be people that... um, work in advertising, people that walk dogs, people that do landscaping, all of that will tie into it. And then the third component of it is that career and technical student organization. You've probably seen FFA members wearing their blue corduroy jackets right. around. Can, can you? Okay, so you are the perfect person to help me understand this. Okay. So in my previous job in Washington, D.C., we would have thousands and thousands and thousands mm-hmm. of kids come in the hot time of the year wearing those thick, heavy Mm -hmm. um, jackets. Is there a significance to that? I actually did that in uh, the summer of 2000. Okay. Um, That is what the FFA refers to as official dress. You have a blue corduroy jacket that has not changed since FFA was established in 1928. You have the white collared shirt. Males will wear a tie. Females will wear a scarf. Um, Up until 2014, ladies were required to wear at least a knee-length black dress and black stockings. And their state is on the back of the jacket. Yes, sir. Black closed-toed shoes, and the men have to wear black slacks. And in 2014, they changed it, and ladies could actually wear pants as well instead of the skirt. Um, Every jacket has a little bit of a difference to it. But it's all the same as you go across. If you ever see a jacket that only has the FFA emblem in the center of the back and no words on it, that would mean that that is a national FFA officer. If you see one that has, we'll use example of Tennessee, Tennessee at the top, you have the FFA emblem and it says association at the bottom. That is going to be a state FFA officer. And then the cool thing is uh, I've always told my students when we go to Gatlinburg for state FFA convention in March, Everybody's jacket is exactly the same until you look at the very bottom, and their chapter name is at the bottom. Okay. So 
when you're at the state convention, everybody's the same except for the bottom, and you look at that. When you go to a national convention, chapters really don't mean that much. You look at the top of the emblem because then you see people from all 50 states. Well, I would always go and try to find Tennessee. I would yes. say, you know, where's the Tennessee rep? And then I would always pose for pictures, you know, with the Tennessee. So person. I was kind of a rebel. I still am a little bit of a rebel. Mm-hmm. Um, I do not like hose, especially in July. You don't want to be wearing pantyhose. And that was like a sweat factory wearing that corduroy jacket in July, marching around all those monuments. Right. But they said until someone passed out, we could not take those jackets off. Because when you see that blue corduroy jacket, everybody knows what that means. Well, just, I mean, you know, I am i don't want to be like I know it all. But, mm-hmm. but what if they made also like just a little cotton, a little cotton jacket? that they could also print the same things on to use in the warmer months. You would think that, but no. Well, that's, pretty my, hardcore. that's my suggestion. For yeah, it's pretty hardcore. They're going to stick with it. I'm just glad they got rid of the pantyhose for the ladies and the skirt. You can wear pants now because I was a rebel, I'll tell you, in 2000. Yeah. I was posing for the picture up there at the Lincoln Monument, and I didn't wear my black pantyhose. Uh-oh. They would not let me be in the front of the picture. I wow. had to get back because if anyone saw that, they knew I was not in official dress. Oh my goodness, <laughs> that's insane! Well, I'm I'm uh, so glad to have that cleared up for me. Yes, because I have always yes. it's been on my list. Like anytime I see it, I'm like, I gotta figure that out. Yes, so but thank you for that. FFA is probably the most recognized, but that but that may just be my perception because that's what I've been involved with. But you also have a health science organization called HOSA. Uh, Health Occupation Students of America. Now, little known fact, okay. uh, when I was a senior in high school, okay. I was in Health Occupations Education. Now, I don't know if that's like a sister organization or any yes, connection at all. probably. But. My sister, um, older sister, much older sister, <laughs> um, was in FHA okay. when she was in high school, Future Homemakers of America. Mm-hmm. And that has now changed to a, a FCCLA, Family, Career, and Family Something career, else. consumer leaders of America. Okay. Um, but that's what goes along with your home ec, what you would normally think of as home ec. Mm-hmm. We also have uh, DECA oh, and yeah. FBLA, Future Business Leaders of America. Uh, those are going to tie into our business courses. Uh, you have Skills USA, which tie into advanced manufacturing and mechatronics, um, which is really the big word right now. Everybody thinks we need to do that. These are basically what m- most people would think of as maintenance men. And these and these are all things to help kids who um, are trying to figure out what track they want to get on, what Correct. do they want to do for the rest of their life. Yes. Um, and and I hear a lot of people in this area talking about how we have um, a lack of there is. people to fill some of these really important jobs. That there is be done. such a shortage in our area. For years, everybody pushed, you must go to college. You must go to college. And one thing I always taught in my classroom, we I made students do a resume. They had to do a cover letter, uh, and you had to research a career. Now, when you research that career, you didn't just look up how much money you made, because normally a kid in high school is going to look at how much money they make, and, and that's the job I'm going to do. And for so long, people have heard the word college dropout or dropout in general and thought it was a bad word. So I always use the example, I have two college degrees. And my husband is a college dropout. Uh, He is a journeyman lineman, which is a trades job. And he makes twice what I make. And Mm -hmm. he's a college dropout. And I have two college degrees. And that always kind of helped my students. And they thought, okay, there is a bigger picture here. So we have really pushed students um, to go the post-secondary route. You've got to go to college. You have to get a four-year degree. You know, we've got um, the Tennessee Promise Scholarship and the Hope Scholarship that helps these students do that. And we tell them that will make you happy. When yes. that's all over with, you'll be rich you, and yes. you'll be happy. And the jobs will be there and you'll be great. And if your family can't afford it, get lots of student loans. That's right. Because that will really you will help your definitely happiness. be able to pay those back. Right. So there, there's finally an understanding that trades jobs can can really make you successful. I've always told kids, if it's something that is stinky, something that is dangerous, something that is dirty, chances are you can make more money doing that than you can in whatever job you've looked up. Because people will pay big bucks. If your toilet won't flush on the weekend, you're going to pay that plumber to come out, and he's going to charge you a service charge for coming out on the weekend. But you know what? When you want that stuff to go down, you want it to go down. Mm-hmm. So you call the plumber out, and he is more than happy to come out on the weekends. Right. Right. And, and, you know, an electrician, 
you want to be for sure when you flip that light switch that that light goes on. You don't need a four-year degree to be able to do that. You can go to um, a TCAT, a Tennessee College of Applied Technology, or a two-year program, get an associate's degree, or maybe even do an apprenticeship, which would help them be so successful in that career. So what about um, agriculture just in general? We've been... um, Uh, doing a lot of research on agriculture for a project we're working on here. And, um, you know, one of the things that we keep hearing from a lot of the people in the agriculture industry is that there aren't enough people working in some of the ag-related areas. Um, So I know that's sort of an area that's near and dear to your heart. So talk a little bit about agriculture as it relates to that. Um, There are so many areas of agriculture that have become so advanced. But then again, there are so many that that are basically the same way that your grandparents did it. Um, my husband and I grow six acres of pumpkins at our house, and we both have full-time jobs on top of that. We're getting close to, like, your high season then. I know. It's, yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes, it's been a bad growing year, though. Uh-oh. Has it because of way, all the— We had way too much water at the end of June, 1st of July, okay. and it caused all the female blooms to abort. Oh. And then the roots did not anchor like they should have. So then we went 64 days with a tenth of inch of rain. Mm. My plants are still alive. And but it's the heat. It's been really hot, too. Does it that has been really hot. Last year, we had trouble with that. We had a you know real, real warm period, and we had a lot of heavy rain at the 1st of September. It beat all the leaves off of it, and then the sun came out, and it sun scalded probably 1,500 pumpkins sitting out in the oh, field at our wow. house. Uh, and, of course, once they're sun scalded, it's it's not a sellable product. You just got to throw it off in the ditch or feed it to a pig. Oh, my goodness. So that was what we had last year. And this year, we've been very fortunate every year. We've had really good crops. And this year, we're kind of, we've got about a quarter of what we normally have oh off goodness. of our six acres. But there's still plenty to go around, and we're yeah. still going to have a good fall. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing what those little plants will do with very little water, you know. Um, but in, in that area, my husband and I, when we started out with it, we walked with a stick, and this has been six years ago, poked a hole in the ground, dropped a seed in, and covered it up. Now, we've gotten really advanced in our pumpkin farming, and we have a one-row corn planter that he's put a John boat seed on mm-hmm. and a funnel in between my legs, and he marks every four feet on the back of the tire on the tractor. Mm-hmm. So as that little stripe comes up, I drop one seed, and we drop every seed roughly a thousand seeds per acre wow and we plant that all by hand it's all harvested by hand you spray it uh we do have a a ranger that we drive through there and spray with but beyond that it it's that way so you're doing precision farming when you're dropping that hole. true that is precision i was just going to say on the flip side of it if you look at some of these row crops Mm -hmm. you've got tractors that drive without an operator in them right you can have the farmer sitting on the side of the field And he can use basically like kids would with a remote control car to operate these tractors and never go into the field. Yeah, we had a farmer the other day say he programs his tractor in his bed before he even gets up in the morning. Yes. And you have farmers that on their cell phone, there's an app. They can turn on an irrigation system 100 miles away. They can be sitting on a beach and be hundreds of miles away and turn on an irrigation system in northwest Tennessee. And and from what I understand, they also know – one section of a field might need a little more water than the next little tiny section of the field. And so they can literally water things in little tiny bits. Yes. And they've also saved a lot of money doing that with precision ag in fertilizer application. You can go out and spend a lot of time at the beginning taking soil samples. And if you've got a part of the field that will not produce as good as the other part, just because it's poor soil, you aren't going to want to put all that extra money in fertilizer there because it's not going to give you what you need anyway. And so they can do these heat maps that show you where your highest yield is and where your lowest yield is. And then you don't spend the extra money putting fertilizer that's not going to benefit you. And you can bump up the fertilizer um, in an area that would. And so the key is taking some of the smart and talented young folks that are juniors and seniors and you know that are in high school now mm-hmm. And getting them into some of these fields where they can continue yes. the innovation that's going on, where they can apply the innovation that they've learned. Um, in, your pre, in your previous role, welcome mm-hmm. to Weekly County, by the way. Thank in, you. I in, came back home. In your previous role, tell us a little bit about where you were and the accomplishments that you had there, because I thought it was really interesting. Um, I had a, a very good but scary opportunity. Um, I was actually teaching at my alma mater. And the, the number of students had decreased to a point where my job was only a, a part-time job. Um, and so with that, I applied for a job to start an ag program. At and McKin- what was your alma mater? 
Dresden High School. Okay. Uh, I taught agriculture at Dresden High School for two years. Uh, and my second year, I was only teaching half a day. And so the opportunity presented itself at McKinsey High School. They wanted to start an ag program. So I went there, and there was a, an old storage building with fiberglass over it that had poke salad growing all the way up through the ceiling of it. It had old showers in it and football training equipment. And they said, have fun, grow plants in it. Well, I took on the challenge. And um, after about four years, we were able to recover that storage building with some polycarbonate and actually were able to grow some plants. And the agriculture community is is a beast all its own. It's a wonderful thing. They look out for one another. Um, and the people in that community saw that there was a need and that the students needed this to actually grow. And um, so we got a little bit of money donated, got a few little grants going in the works. Uh, we were able to put in a greenhouse and we had enough money left over. We were able to build a shop beside it to store all of our extra supplies and um, let students work in that shop with hands-on, hands-on learning. Um, and then I was able to put an irrigated mat. Our big fundraiser, my first year there, I said, okay, every program needs some type of fundraiser. So we were going to sell mums. There was a local Amish community close by. We bought mums from, and I think we sold 130 mums that first year. And I was so excited. You know, and they're like mums in pots. Yes, potted mums, chrysanthemums that you would see here during the fall season. And um, so we, it's 130 of them, and I was so excited about that. And last year, we sold 950 mums. Wow. Um, and probably about 2,500 2, pumpkins. Um, that is what that program had grown up to. Um, and so the community saw that we were doing a good thing. Um, I wanted my students to be able to see uh, the irrigated mat. We started growing our own chrysanthemums. Um, and it, it has a little fence around it. It's a beautiful little area. Then the greenhouse, um, I wanted students to see how you grew in a greenhouse just regularly. Then we also had an aquaponics system. And aquaponics is different from hydroponics in the fact that aquaponics actually has fish in there. So it's it's organic completely. Um, the fi- You feed the fish. The fish are going to feed your plants. Your plants grow. Everything is wonderful. Uh, tomatoes will grow all the way up to the ceiling. It's crazy. They'll produce year-round. Um But the students were able to see the irrigated mat. They were able to see how aquaponics worked. They were able to see how a regular greenhouse ran. Um, And then we had raised bed gardens in between the shop and the greenhouse. Uh, The next step was going to be to do a pot and pot nursery. But I feel that with the move that I've made as career and technical education director, now I have four high schools and I have five ag teachers, six ag teachers that I work with. Um, So the possibilities can just continue growing. Um, just because I have left that one school does not mean that I can't keep this continuing on. Um, and, and, and in our society today, people are hear the word organic, and they think it means it's so much better. So maybe that will be a career that these students can actually take. I mean, they're going to learn in this class and then be able to take it and, and make a career out of it. And so what what – as an educator, as a person mm-hmm. who really, in addition to just a job, obviously you can tell it's a passion for it you. It is. You know, what are, what are your biggest uh, challenges in trying to get these young folks from children mm-hmm. into being functioning, contributing adults? Um, one thing that I saw, um, I guess it was probably my first year that I taught at McKenzie High School. I had a student, chronic absenteeism, um, a discipline problem all the time. I think he was very misunderstood. Um, came from a home life that most people would look at and say, oh, that kid's not going to make it very far. Um, loved to work with his hands. Did not want to do book work at all. Well, in this building that I was given, we were trying to retrofit it to grow plants in, and I needed to cut holes in the tin siding on it to put an exhaust fan in. And that kid, he said, Miss Parm, I know all about wiring, and I will help you. And I said, you know what? That is your job from now on. The kid came to school early. He gave up his break. He did all sorts of things. And all it is is having a little bit of confidence in that kid and finding out what that kid likes. Um, And something that we're trying to do in Weekly County, we're putting in work-based learning where these students that are not only going to learn in the classroom, but they're going to have that opportunity to go out into the workforce and possibly do job shadowing opportunities, apprenticeships, all sorts of things that could potentially lead it to them. I've always told them, if you see it, if you smell it, and if you hear it, you will know if you can really do it. This is the time that you need to decide, can I do that? People used to tell me, 
you need a job in healthcare. People are always going to get sick and you need a job in healthcare. And that's fine and that's good. And I love people and I love to help people. Human waste, I really don't deal well with. Um, <laughs> that's why you call the plumber on the weekend. That's right. That's why I call. No, I can do the plumbing. Uh, <laughs> it's something about that diaper that you have to change. Oh, yeah. I can't deal with. Uh, I have had two children. I did deal with those, yeah. but they're just because they were my flesh and blood. You had to. Yeah, I had to. It was kind of like I couldn't make them live in it. That's right. Um, but you have to have those people. And there are those people that have a passion for healthcare, and that's wonderful. And I think everybody should have that opportunity. But while you're in school is when you need to decide. Because that is the last time your education is totally free. Mm-hmm. Really and truly, that not that there are not post-secondary instructors that care about their students, but really and truly, that is the last place you are going to see somebody that really does care. Do you have clean clothes on? Mm-hmm. Did you get something to eat before you came to school? And then you try to teach them on top of that. Mm. Um, and so I think you, you bring those kids in and you love on them. And once they know that you care for them, They'll do anything you ask of them. Um, Dresden High School was very, very good in competing in FFA contests. So when I left Dresden to go to McKenzie, I just assumed that's exactly how it was going to go. And we didn't win anything Mm. that first year. And, man, it really started getting to me. And I thought, ah, I really want my kids to be successful. And then I realized people look at success in all different ways. Everybody has a different measure and stick for how successful you are. And my students were able to take part in um, Farm Bureau Shooting Hunger in Middle Tennessee. And they came back and they said, Miss Parma, I want to do that. And I said, okay, you help me plan it. And so my kids came back four years ago, and we sat down and we started planning something. Of course, with the school, you can't use the word shoot, gun, anything like that mm-hmm. without being crucified. Mm-hmm. Um, so we <laughs> came up with the name Blast Out Hunger. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I had a group of about 10 students that helped steer that committee. And we set up our first Blast Out Hunger event to benefit the Second Harvest Food Bank of West Tennessee and Hunters for the Hungry. And we raised over $12,000 in our first year and gave every penny of it to Second Harvest Food Bank and Hunters for the Hungry. And think of how happy that made them, how much they felt like they contributed. And I realized my kids don't want that little blue plaque that everybody else is going after. Mm -hmm. My kids want to make an impact. And not saying that they were better than anybody else, but I kind of feel like they they, maybe they were, you know, they were a little special. <laughs> I'm sure they were. But those kids still come back today. They've graduated. And they said, can we help with this year's event? Right. Um, and we did actually, after I took this job, we we rushed it up. And, and we're still getting donations in, so I don't have a total for what this last one did. But we were able to do it in June or July this past year. Uh, and Weekly County was was gracious enough to let me go on and, and do that event one more time before I left McKenzie. But that's what my students wanted. They wanted see, to help I think, others. I think as as important as education is very important, mm-hmm. but it's not one size fits all. And I think mm-hmm. things like what you're talking about, things like the arts, you know, yes. in high school are very important to give kids who maybe don't fit the mold another avenue to find success. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when my kids were in high school, it used to drive me crazy that the biggest pressure they would get to take AP classes, to get A's, to, you know, grade point average. Oh, yeah. You, know, you got to get in cut was from the teachers, you know, and I even had to tell a few, hey, settle down. You know, I, I want happy, yes. well-adjusted children, not just kids who took all AP classes. Well, and, and you still have those teachers that feel that way. And, I mean, in the world we're in, things are driven by test scores. We over-test our children, period. I mean, there's no other way around it. If you look at how many tests students take, it's it's outrageous. Um, I, I just went to a meeting last week talking about dual enrollment opportunities in career and technical education. And that's fine and that is good. But most of and I and I told the people at the meeting, most of these students want to get core courses out of the way. They don't want to spend it on an elective course. Mm-hmm. Um, most of the people that I see these days that are going to go back to the family farm are getting a degree because you need it. Mm -hmm. Um, You need to know about market, marketing your product, your, your commodity. You want to make sure you can sell it. It's not your granddaddy's farm anymore. You know, it's get big or go big or go home. Is what I always told my kids. That would be the headline if we were doing a newspaper article. Um, yeah, it's not your granddaddy's farm. Anymore. That's true. That uh, that is true. There are so many things though that people do just because that's the way grandma or granddaddy did it. Right. Um, but kids are having a lot. I, I went to college with several young men that the only reason they were there 
was because my daddy said I had to get a college degree. And before we graduated, they said, you know what? This is really going to benefit us. Mm -hmm. And they're going to bring things in. Um, Tosh Farms is one that I like to look at. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jimmy Tosh has been raising hogs his whole life. Mm -hmm. And look at the multi-million dollar farm that they are now running. And they just continue to get bigger and bigger. Yeah. Um, and it is because they have diversified. And they know how to do it right. I mean, it, you, True. You and if they what, don't know how to do it, they're going to get somebody in there that does know how to do it. Yeah, I wanted to just go in and look at the pigs, but it didn't oh, work no, that way. Oh, no, you need to take a shower. You, and yeah, and I, I worked in a I breeding have, and farrowing facility, actually, while I was in college for I didn't Tosh have Farms. time to take a shower, but at Tosh mm -hmm. Farms, and you got to step in stuff and put stuff on. And I mean, it's a big ordeal yes. to go into there. Oh, yes. It's not just going looking at the, oh, looking no. at the hogs. Oh, mm -hmm. no. And... and on the flip side of that, the breeding and farrowing facility that I worked at, mm -hmm. I was just a college kid, you know, and it was just to make a, you know, a dollar. That's the reason I worked there. And then it ended up being a passion. That happens a lot with things that I do. I don't know why. <laughs> um, but when we got there in the morning, you rolled out of bed, you brushed your teeth, you went to work, you took all of your clothes off on one mm -hmm. side of the shower, you stepped in the shower, showered in, they gave you your clothes on the other side, you went and did your job. When you got done, you took all of that off, left it there to be washed there, walked wow. back into the shower, took the shower and put your clothes back on that you came to work in. Um, and we still managed to get uh, a disease. Mm -hmm. It was PERS is what it's called, porcine reproductive respiratory syndrome. Mm. And it, ama it makes these hogs abort mm. prematurely. And so we would go out in the breeding barn and you would have little baby pigs. Mm. Some of them would be dead because they aborted too early. Some of them would still be alive. We'd have to scoop them up, try to save them. Um, but we ended up having to depopulate that entire barn. Wow. Get rid of every hog that was in there. We had to power wash everything down, disinfect it. It had to sit for over a month to make for sure all the disease was dead and gone from it before we could repopulate that. So some people may look at that as kind of an extreme, oh, you won't let me go in and look at your pigs? Why? What are you doing in there? Well, it's for the pig's safety. Right. Those And I've tried to explain to people, those animals, you look at a confined animal feeding operation and you think, oh, those poor little animals, they are taken so much better care of in that building than an animal that's just out on the farm, and that's what that's what I, I hear from them quite often. Is yes. look, this is my investment. You know, why would I not take one hundred percent the best care of my investment that I possibly could? Right. I mean, you look at it; if they're in a climate controlled facility. They have unlimited access to fresh water. They get fed, and unlike some of us. Me in particular, they have a well balanced diet to make for sure that they don't get obese and start having problems with their joints and with their bones. And, you know, that they're not malnourished and can't get around. I mean, they have got basically a dietitian that's there with them every day telling them what they need to eat and drink. When they get sick, you know it immediately and you're able to give them some type of medication to make them feel better. Um, and, and so I just feel like they are uh, some of those. Now, I'm not saying there's not a bad apple out oh, there. There's course. always a bad apple right. that will ruin it for everybody. Right. But nine times out of ten, that animal is more or better taken care of than, you know, probably we are in some now, instances. I, I know that um, here in this area, because we just went through the whole fair thing. Yeah. That, you know, the kids, the ki and I'm fascinated by this whole, everybody was explaining it to me. A group was explaining it to me like, it's something that happens everywhere, but kids like get baby chicks. Uh -huh. And so why don't you tell a little bit about what happens with that whole process? Okay, so children in Weekly County are mistreated because there is not a Weekly County Fair. Okay, mm. so you have to go to the big Obine, Obine County, County fair, fair if you want to see a good fair. Um, but these students, it teaches them responsibility. It teaches them animal husbandry. And at the end of it, you're going to sell your animal and you're going to get some money out of it. And you know, that's what drives all of us. And so they get chicks. Is it chicks and oh, cows you can and get, calves You can get and a goats chick, and, you can get a calf, you can get a pig, and you can babies. get a goat. Yes. And then you raise it, you take care of it, mm -hmm. you name it maybe. Of um, course. Any yeah. pet that you have, you name. <laughs> right? Right. Of course. But then you have to teach, you have to give them that hardcore farm kid lesson. Yeah. That, that then you eat it. You eat it at the end. You know, <laughs> yeah, that, that's yeah. the bad part about it, it all. It feeds all of us. Right. Yeah. But but that's their pet. And they're going right. to walk it around on a leash. My daughter, we don't go to a fair, but we may or may not have some chickens that she walks around on leashes because, right. you know, that's fun. the cool thing to do. Because if you can do that, why not? Right. If you can um, walk your rooster around on a leash, you want to. But then there's an auction, right? Mm -hmm. And so people bring money and theoretically... 
if you have a rich granddaddy, it, I think that you, happened last year here, didn't it? Yeah, if you have a rich granddaddy, then they bid more, and so then oh, yeah. the parents hopefully take that money and invest it. Correct. You know, for the student to either go to college or apply to, to a technical right. school. And as whatever. the student gets older, if they are in FFA, that can become their supervised agricultural experience program. They can actually start a herd of goats or a herd of cows or whatever they want to. And you may start out with that heifer that you were showing, which would be a female cow. Mm -hmm. um, you've got that show heifer that you have. Well, then you breed her and she has a calf. Well, now your herd went from one to two. And their money that they get for showing, because even if you don't sell it, you're still going to get prize money for showing your animal. You can use that to put back into your program, like for feed or for vaccinations or for medications, or maybe you need a pretty new halter or a shiny little belt to make you be a good showman. See, if I was a kid, I would try to find like a <coughs> two-headed calf or something like that. Yeah, they don't live to, very long. They don't. Mm. But do, do they win a prize? If you bring that, to uh, maybe the, Guinness Book of World Records, yeah. the craziest thing. <laughs> maybe that something. They don't, so yeah. that's really not. You, yeah, you, you don't discourage want that. that. That's a mutation. That, you don't want that, mutations. Yeah, gotcha. they, they don't like. Okay. Well, it's fast. I didn't get to go to the fair this year. I was so disappointed because I was really excited to get to. see It is all hardcore, that. like cutthroat. People tell me it, and people were um, really going into great detail. I'm telling you, about, there was. Um, I, I want to say maybe twenty five thousand dollars for a chicken last year. <laughs> at O'Bion County, and it was one of those rich grandma kind of things. Yeah, yeah, that was. I um, would love to have a twenty five thousand dollar chicken. I'd sell her in a me heartbeat. Too. I me don't care too. what her name is. She's Next gone. year, you may you may see me walking around with a chicken on yeah, a leash. Chicken on a leash, trying, <laughs> trying yeah. to get somebody to to yeah. um, pay that much money. So, what's what is your um, vision? What what do you see three years from now for this new gig that you have? So, my new gig is coming with a lot of hurdles. Mm -hmm. um, my focus will all has always been will always be what is best for the student. Um, so we have formed a committee, a CTE advisory committee is what we call it, and I brought in industry partners and things. I want to know where the jobs are. I don't want to train the best worker to ship them out of this area. I want to train a good worker, and then I want to keep that worker here. I want to keep them in our area. Um, so I've tried to bring in business and industry and say, hey, what do you guys need? Um, I'm working to fill out grants to try to build up our existing facilities. Um, partnered with TCAT because I think these Tennessee colleges of applied technology can offer so many wonderful things. And post-secondary credit is great, but if they are learning a trade, that will make a kid. I have seen students at McKenzie graduate high school and go straight into a career in welding or, you know, I'm trying to think of another good culinary arts, anything like that. Refrigeration, I'm hearing, is HVAC so and refrigeration. Here. These kids can graduate high school and have enough hours to go right into the workforce, making more than what I make. Right. But I mean, right. teacher salary is not that much. But I, mean, I heard like a starting a starting salary for someone in refrigeration in this area. There was a job open. It was like ninety five thousand dollars yes. a year. Yes, you know, welders. If you don't want to work hard, you're looking at between sixty and seventy five thousand. If you do want to work hard and you're willing to move, you're looking at six figures. And there are a lot of professional people who major in some very sophisticated quote unquote. Yes, um, that never make that. Correct. <laughs> yeah, I will so, never make that in right, my life. Right. Uh, and have six years of college under my belt. Um, yeah. Well, my my youngest daughter w did her freshman year in, in traditional college, um, mm -hmm. and now she's just started yesterday um, at uh, College of Cosmetology. So mm -hmm. she felt like that was more in line with what she wanted to do with her life. Well, and we are working with partnerships. Um, cosmetology is offered at TCAT Paris, and... That would be the closest one to Weekly County. There are see, others I told in the area. Her if she would come here, she could say she went to school in Paris. That would sound mm -hmm. very fancy it for cosmetology. Would. It would. It? Yeah. Um, then you've got like Arnold's Beauty School in Paris. You've also got one in Milan, Tennessee that would work. Can't think of the name of it off the top of my head. But but things like that. And the kids can graduate high school and go straight in the workforce. I feel like that's where we lose our kids. They get that summer off and they get that break. And then they really don't know what they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, one good thing that we're working with um, as eighth graders, we ask these kids, we say, okay, you're 12, 13 years old. Let's go ahead and lay out what your focus of study is going to be for your right. high school career. 
Right. Dude probably didn't even pick out his clothes this morning by himself. Mama did that for him, okay? <laughs> right. That's how I ended up in health occupations education. Okay. I, th- I thought I wanted to be an EMT. And so that seemed to be the closest thing. So I checked right. that box and I didn't even realize I joined anything. Right. And so you had no exposure to what you were signing up for, you know. And these kids are stuck in these pathways for the most part. Uh, very hard to get out of that once you've chosen it because. There are so many requirements for graduation, very little wiggle room for electives. So what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to start out with the sixth graders, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. We're going to start doing some exposure. Here is what we can offer. What interests you? For so long, we have taught courses because that's what we have the textbooks for, and that's what the teacher likes to teach. You know what? That kid may not care anything in the world about what that is. So why are we cornholing ourselves and making the kids take exactly what they've always taught? And so I'm going to try, of course, I know you say we're going to survey and everybody's like, oh, yeah, that's going to go really far. But I am. We're going to survey. And I want to know what these kids really are interested in. Now, in sixth grade, I don't know how much weight you would take with that, but you can kind of get an idea, a feel for how that group is. It'd be interesting to know just what they would say, you know. (laughs) Correct. Um, And as it goes on, that's what I want to teach. Mm-hmm. In my opinion, as an educator, when you get comfortable, you're not growing and the kids aren't growing. If you don't have to do a little bit of study and research at night before you go in the classroom the next day, how cutting edge are you really teaching? Mm-hmm. Um, and and so I kind of want to keep our teachers on our on their toes, too. You all need to be evolving as everybody else around us is. Mm -hmm. Um, And and I don't think we – I think business, we kind of get overlooked around here. Business and industry in northwest Tennessee kind of overlooks us a little bit because we don't have a trained workforce. Um, And if we can better prepare our kids, not, oh, we're just going to send them to the university. And see, I would make the argument that because we have this gigantic museum and heritage park right here that um, hospitality – the hospitality industry will continue to grow, and we're going to need some really good hospitality workers. We have actually been talking about that. I've been in several discussions about that uh, with the Garage Project mm-hmm. at UT oh, Martin. Oh, yeah, sure. And with the Hope of the Convention Center, the large convention center coming into Weekly County. I've heard about that. Yes. Yeah. Wouldn't that be nice if that it came would, about? That would be very nice. And so in order to fill those jobs and here Mm -hmm. uh, with the Discovery Park of America. And with restaurants coming this way, three brand new hotels right next door. Mm -hmm. um, You know, I really think that's – and it's there's we are going to need people who are – who know what they're doing when it comes to all that And I think sometimes that's overlooked. Mm -hmm. When you think about culinary arts and hospitality, normally people think about more metropolitan areas. Mm -hmm. They don't think about – but look around, people. We need those. Right. There are more jobs than McDonald's in – Mm-hmm. culinary arts. Yeah, that's uh, right. And, and I think sometimes we're we're kind of just overlooked because of the size, because of our size. Um, but if we can get them going in that direction, I think that would be a shot in the arm for everybody. Well, I, am I for one, am very glad you're here. Yes. So thank you for coming back uh, to this area. Thank and, of course, you. you can count on Discovery Park to do anything we need to do to help. Thank you. We you, would appreciate it. You are very welcome. Um, and if anybody, do you have anything online or anything where people can see more about what you're doing, or is that to come? Uh, that is to come. Okay. Um, weekly you count. Are you a tweeter? I'm not a tweeter. Oh, we- but we have a wonderful PR person with okay. the Weekly County Schools, Miss Karen Campbell. Miss Karen Campbell is a she, force to be reckoned with. She is. You better watch out, buddy. She has a good Twitter. So if, if anybody wants to get to you, go to Twitter. Look for Karen Campbell. That is exactly how I got here today was Miss Karen Campbell because she is all about Twitter and she is all about Instagram. That's right. You didn't even know you were going to be podcasting. That's correct. This is your first podcast, this right? This is my first podcast. There you See, I'm so glad that we can. I hopefully so we were a good first experience for oh, you I've on podcasting. It. I've loved it. I hope everybody's still listening. Uh, oh, there, there's thousands of people who, who are still listening yes. right now. More and more, they're calling their friends, telling yes. them to download this podcast. Yes. Um, thank you very much, and um, I hope to see you and a whole bunch of your students here again very soon. Me too. Thank you. And now Andrew Gibson is taking us behind the scenes at Discovery Park of America to see what we may be able to discover today. 
Thank you, Scott. I am Andrew Gibson with the Education Department here at beautiful Discovery Park of America. And today I am with Tom Pyron, a docent here, who will be sharing some stories, uh, talking to us about some of the cotton and the cotton field we have, uh, our cotton crop, I guess we had to have behind here at Discovery Park of America. So my first question for you, Tom, is how are you doing today? Oh, it's been a great day. Yeah, it's been, it's always a great day at DPA. It, it, it really is. Yeah. A lot of good families here today. Yeah. Um, so, so Tom, uh, let's start talking about the, the, the cotton crop out back. I'll just tell you a little bit about my background, but I, I grew up in Memphis, which is not really a, what you'd call a cotton area, but I was the first generation to grow up in the city. All, my family had lived for generations in McNary County, Tennessee, and my grandfather was a cotton farmer. He, that's, that is where I really learned to appreciate the rural life, and I love going out to visit him, especially uh, during the cotton harvest time, because it's, it's, it's exciting when you, when you can get into the cotton, and uh, especially when the cotton crop is good and it's uh, easy to pick. Uh, I had to remember that I would go in and enjoy working about an hour or two but there were folks that worked for him that uh, would work long, hot days. And, uh, but uh, I, I, I really saw the joy in uh, harvesting a good crop of cotton. When, uh, when the cotton would come in, they would, uh, the workers would fill up these long cotton sacks that they'd carry over their shoulders, and they would fill them up uh, full, and that's how they would get paid. They'd get what, they would take those and... Uh, have them weighed, and they'd get paid that amount for whatever poundage they'd pick. Now, um, real quick, I'm sorry for interrupting, but um, when is the ideal time to pick cotton? Th- that's one of the cool things about us having a cotton crop here, because cotton, even though cotton, we have such a heritage of growing cotton in West Tennessee, a lot of people, especially young people, don't know the life cycle for cotton. Uh, but cotton uh, has recently been in the blooming stage, and it's really... When you go by a cotton field that's blooming, and and what and out back of uh, the Discovery Center, it's blooming right now, and it's a it's a real pretty yellow bloom. After that has bloomed, then it starts right at the base of the flower is a is the bowl, and the bowl starts swelling up after the flower is gone, and uh, after it swells up to a certain point, and if the weather is nice and dry, it bursts open, and there's the cotton. It still has to dry quite a bit uh, because you want the cotton to be nice and dry, and all the bowl around it is going to be dry. Uh, that's one of the that's one of the things that you hear people complain about when they've had to pick a lot of cotton because it's also very has a has little points on the end of the bowl, and if you don't reach right into the middle, it uh, it can really tear your hands up. So. Yeah, the fact that uh, that in our tool barn out back, that's part of the display at Discovery Park, I'm so glad we've got one of these big cotton sacks because it's real pleasure to see some of the older folks come through with their grandchildren and they can say, this is what I did when I was your age. I would drag these through a cotton field and pick cotton, and that's what we did. Uh, in fact, a lot of the schools around in West Tennessee, they would let out six weeks for cotton picking. And, uh, you know, most of the rural schools did. I, I'm not sure about Union City, but I know all, I know at McNary County they did. They let out because that's something that, one, it was a good way for kids to make a little extra money by picking some cotton. But we need, they needed all the help they could get to get the cotton crop in. You, you mentioned, you know, grandparents talking to grandkids. Do we still pick cotton by hand today? No, no. Now, at Discovery Park, we do. We do pick cotton by hand, and, and, and that's something if, if you come, probably in, uh, in September and October uh, with your children or grandchildren, that'd be, that's really a fun activity to go back there and pick cotton. And we encourage you here to do that. That's one of the reasons we grow it. We want people to be able to do that. But I'm so, I think it's so cool that uh, also now we have just in the last few weeks uh, – Added to our display of old farm equipment, we've added a one-row cotton picker, and that was the beginning of the revolution on our on our family farms for uh, raising cotton, because now you could pick the cotton mechanically, and I, in my understanding, is when we when we start out with these early cotton pickers, 
they weren't super efficient, and we would have to have people come in behind them and uh, and repick what was left over. But that was a real starting point, and and this is one of the earliest cotton pickers, I believe, that we have on display here. It's an international harvester, and at least in my family's tradition, that's really a big deal because uh, my my dad and several of his brothers, when they moved to Memphis, they all went to work for International Harvester, which was one of the biggest plants in Memphis, and that's what they mainly did at the beginning. They made cotton pickers. So that was that was a good connection with what we had uh, done on the farm, with where the farming was going. And so by the time my dad retired, they were multi-row cotton pickers, very efficient cotton pickers. And so it was uh, farming has come a long way, particularly cotton farming. All right. Well, thank you, Tom, for, for coming on and, and sharing those great, fantastic stories with us today. Um, for our guests, you can come to Discovery Park, where we pride ourselves on hands-on experiences. Uh, so come to the park, pick some cotton, touch a dinosaur bone, do a whole lot of cool stuff. Uh, and thank you all for listening to uh, the Real Foot Forward, a West and Sea podcast. And we hope to see you here at Discovery Park of America real soon. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.